Hoffman this week on the Lady Brain Show. Spencer Christian, weather anchor for ABC7, will be here. And I also talk with Auli'i Cravalho, the voice behind Moana. You have had a very wide-ranging career. Yeah. Can you give us some of the highlights? Yeah. Well, I started my career as a as a news reporter because I wanted to be a journalist when I was in college. And I still think of myself as a weather journalist. But I've, I've done news. I've been a sportscaster. I've done a talk show. And, of course, I've done weather. Um, during my years at Good Morning America, I probably had the widest ranging and richest career experience. I traveled to four continents on various assignments. I covered... I, I broadcast from hurricanes, floods, blizzards. I also interviewed, uh, I've interviewed six presidents in my career. I've um, played basketball against the Harlem Globetrotters in a, in a charity game at Madison Square Garden. Um, those are some of the, the highlights. But, but basically, w without trying to recall all the names, I would say during my 13 years ago, Morning America, I probably met and or interviewed virtually every prominent figure in sports, politics, theater, the arts, and yet, as interesting as those people were, um, some of the most memorable people I've met have been the ordinary people who've yeah. done something extraordinary in their lives. You know, going to a, a town that is devastated by a tornado, and neighbors who had never spoken to each other before were pulling together for survival and supporting each other and loving each other and praying together. And those stories are more touching to me than, you know, the interviews with the famous stars. Right. I can see why. Yeah. Um, that's why you're a delightful human being, because that stuff matters to you. It does matter. That's what really matters. It should matter to all of us. And I, I think. know. Yeah. It really should, especially now. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you quickly about the five presidents, or six. Six. Six now. <laughs> <laughs> Six now. That was yeah. going to be my question. So who, yeah. b before now, yeah. who were they? Okay. In chronological order of, of when they served in office, uh, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, uh, Jimmy Carter, with whom I became pretty good friends, uh, Bush the first, George H.W., um, and, uh, and Senator Barack Obama just before he announced his candidacy. So those were the, the first five. And I've also interviewed both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump on numerous occasions. So no matter which one of them was going to win the election, uh, it was going to be another president. That was going to be your sixth. It, yeah. What was Trump like? Well, um, my interviews with Trump spanned a period of about 10 to 15 years, going back to the early 1980s, uh, when he was uh, trying to launch the USFL, the United States Football uh -huh. League, and he owned one of the teams in New Jersey. Um, and I was doing sports in the early 80s at WABC in New York. So I did several interviews with him then about his efforts to, to compete against the NFL. Um, then during my years uh, with Good Morning America, in the later 80s and 90s, I interviewed him several times about uh, his battles against the banks when his, some of his uh, casinos in Atlantic City were going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a time when he approached me about co-hosting a cable talk show he wanted to launch with his then wife, Marla Maples. Oh, so Marla Maples. I, and in addition to that, um, I, I used to be a high roller in the casinos. Uh -huh. So I used to get invited to his VIP parties at his Atlantic City casinos. And I used to, I, I got to see him in a different setting away from the cameras in an exclusive social setting with, you know, uh, special invited guests. So there were, I interacted with him in numerous settings. Well, he's so off the rails in his public setting now as, you know, the leader of the free world. Hmm. I can't imagine. Well, actually, I can't imagine because we've all heard the tapes. We know what he's like in, in private settings. <laughs> right, right. Um, a, a, a man that you would have socialized with hmm. if it wasn't for these work-related or the, the high roller sort of experiences? Um, probably not. Because, uh, and that's not meant to be necessarily a slam against Donald Trump, but throughout my 46-year career, most of the people uh, who have become my, my personal friends or the people I've chosen to spend my good personal quality time with have not been high-profile people, people in the public eye, uh, celebrities, if you will. Uh -huh. uh, there are people who have achieved celebrity whom I find interesting and engaging, but my personal friendships and the people I spend my personal time with tend not to be those people. So we we probably wouldn't have probably would not have been buddies. <laughs> no, I can't see that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, to um, 
be a, an objective journalist here and not say anything too stinging, but you get the point. I get the point. Oh, I'll say all the stinging, stinging stuff for you. God help us. Um, Having was, said that, though, um, of those presidents I've met, uh, I, I did develop a, a lasting personal relationship with one of them, and that's Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And, and we've done some things together. I worked with uh, the Carters in Habitat for Humanity. I had the incredible honor of being invited by the Carter family to MC Jimmy Carter's 75th birthday celebration, which was in 1999 in Americus, Georgia. Um, and we've had other contacts since then. So I guess of, of all those presidents I've met, and they're all interesting in their own in their own way. Um, he's the one I, I probably would have chosen as a personal friend. Wow. You know, yeah. I got um, a holiday card yeah. from Jimmy and Rosalind. Mm -hmm. And all it said, it was a white card, and all it said yeah. on it was, imagine peace. Ah. Okay? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I took that sentiment, and I made yeah. my own holiday card with the same message on it. Also with a hashtag, love Trump's hate. But um, I, <laughs> I feel that the Carters yeah. exemplify goodness. Yes. And I feel like their priorities have always been in the right place. And oh. I'm so happy to hear you say that about them. Because of the, of the presidents that you, you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. You know, that they yeah. would be standouts. They are good people, oh. you know. Uh, and uh, it, uh, Jimmy Carter has written many books, as you probably know. And I've read several of them. And the first uh, book of his that I read is called Living Faith. Because he was the, the first president, I can recall, to speak openly and, and not um, dogmatically about his faith. Mm -hmm. Right? He's a Christian. And, um, and I read that book, and it touched me so deeply. Because he wasn't preaching. He wasn't trying to you know, convert anybody. He was just talking about the role that his faith has played in his life and in shaping his values and the way he views humanity. And I... It was so deeply touching. I read it a second time. Yeah, uh, he he coming from the South. Yeah, um, where his views were not always popular oh and gosh. still are not. No, they're not. I grew up in that old South. I grew up in the old Jim Crow South uh, in Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And my, the world I grew up in was rigidly racially segregated by law until I was nearly twenty years old. When Jimmy Carter ran for governor of Georgia as a man who was opposed to that old system of segregation, he received death threats. Oh, I believe you it. Know, a, a cross was burned on, on uh, one of his properties. And yet he had the moral courage to follow through on his convictions. And become our president. Yes. Okay, we're going to break okay. so much more <laughs> right. with Spencer Christian. Right. We'll be right back. We're back with Spencer Christian, weather anchor for ABC7 here in San Francisco. And Spencer, right before we broke, you talked about growing up in the Jim Crow South. I would yeah. like to elaborate on that, or have you elaborated uh, on that? I'll try to give you the quickest picture I can of what daily life was like. All right, so there were laws in all the southern states and in some of the border states that separated the races, uh, but not just separated them, discriminated against severely, harshly. Um, against blacks and against all non-white uh, groups. So schools were, were segregated. Uh, when my parents took us shopping on the weekend to buy whatever, groceries or school supplies or clothing, uh, water fountains, there were, there were, the clean, shiny water fountains were marked whites only. And the old rundown ones that the, that the stores would not maintain because they didn't care were marked colored. Same thing for bathrooms. Uh, if we went into um, a department store like Sears or... Um, Woolworth, just to, to buy clothes for schools for school. We couldn't try them on because those clothes only Because your black skin couldn't touch right. them? That's right. That's right. You bought what you hoped was your size and hoped it would fit when you got home. Because you weren't going to be able right. to return it either. Exactly. Couldn't return it. However, however, there were a few brave exceptions to the rule. Uh, almost every store I knew that was owned by a Jewish merchant, like let's say Siegel Brothers Shoes, they treated us with the same respect they treated everyone else because they're, you know, for thousands of years, Jews have been persecuted. And so there is, um, I think, part of the, one of the cornerstones of Jewish culture is standing up for social justice mm -hmm. and human rights. And so we knew we could, like, 
I couldn't, black, black kids couldn't play in the public play, playgrounds. Jeez. We couldn't go to the tennis courts. We couldn't go to the swimming pools, but we could go to the JCC. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So anyhow, but my, have, you know, um, ha, having grown up um, in that era, you would think that it was so dehumanizing, and it was. Uh, and so uh, there were so many indignities you suffer every day just trying to be a person. You would think that it could really dim your spirits and make you feel like you were not, you were worthless and you could never amount to anything. But my parents were the most remarkable people. They always instilled these positive values in my brother and me, and they pointed to civil rights, uh, the, the civil rights movement as it played out on the news in the evening, and they would point to every little step forward and say, you see, there's hope. Mm -hmm. Things are going to be better for you. You're going to have opportunities. So I did grow up with, yeah, obviously, uh, a feeling that what I was experiencing every day was unjust, but also with a belief that I could do whatever I wanted to do. And I'm doing it. And look at you. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> that, you know, I know you're a grandfather. Yes. You have one young grandson and you're yes. about to have another. That's correct. Um, yeah. Your daughter is black. Yes. Her partner is, is white. Yes, he's Jewish. He's, he's white. Jewish. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. well. So I have a biracial grandson and another on the way. Um, they live in Boston. Okay. And, which is, you know, fairly open-minded. Well, fairly. Boston isn't always the most liberal place in the world, right? But generally speaking, they live in a region of the country where mm -hmm. people tend to be more tolerant, mm -hmm. more accepting. It's a blue state. Uh, it's a blue state, right. Um, so they haven't, I'm not aware of any personal difficulties they have encountered. Uh, his family is obviously very loving and welcoming or he, he wouldn't have married my daughter, right. and my family feels the same way about him. Uh, but even though in the decades, the first two or three decades after the 60s, when I, having grown up in the Old South, felt our society was moving in the right direction, I feel that we've really been backsliding yes. in the last decade or two. And so my daughter and her husband and, and our families worry about how our wonderful, beautiful, little biracial grandchildren will be treated as they're growing up in a world that is unpredictable in terms of people's attitudes about race, about equality, about gender equality. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's a tough one because, you know, I'm of Mexican and Italian-American descent. Mm -hmm. um, my husband is Jewish mm -hmm. and, and white. Yeah. Um, so our kids are really they're proud of their heritage and they love telling people, well, we're Mexican and we're Italian and we're Jewish. Yeah. You know, like, that's a thing. Yeah. Um, during the campaign, uh, I was watching a press conference. It was right after Trump had gone to um, Mexico and kind of got shown the hand. <laughs> but then he came back to Just Arizona. <laughs> yeah. He came back to Arizona and he said, my first hour in office, I'm going to start deporting people. Mm. And my very bright 12 year old son looked at me and for the first time was frightened and said, are we going to get shipped out of here? Yeah. And I'm like, you know, yeah. explain to him, no, but people you care about are going to be affected by this. They are. They are. And, and I, my grandson Noah is not quite two years old yet. So he's not aware of all mm -hmm. these things yet, but he will encounter, you know, he'll see stuff on the news. He'll hear comments at school or out in public somewhere because everybody isn't kind. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I remember when I was raising my children, by the way, parenting has been the most rewarding experience yeah. in my entire life. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and grandparenting will be too. When I was raising my kids, you know, they were uh, born in the late 70s. Uh, we were, I still felt like we we're moving forward in society. People were becoming more open and more accepting. But I do worry about um, the world in which my grandkids are going to grow up. What are, how are you going to impart your positivity on those little boys? Uh, just give them all the love and encouragement and support that I can and expose them to as many positive experiences as I can. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'll start lecturing them about, you know, everyone in the world isn't always going to be kind to you. But when they have an experience that's disturbing and they ask, why, then we'll have, we'll start yeah. that conversation, which is an ongoing conversation. It never ends. Right. You know, strength coming from um, a, a loving adult, a grandparent or a parent and drawing, you know, sharing your experiences and how you mm. overcame. I always loved that about um, talking with my grandmother is finding out what was it like being a young Mexican woman in, uh, 
you know, in the forties yeah. in the United States. Oh yeah. Um, I'll remember those stories forever. And you know what? It gives me some fierceness and some strength. And I draw upon that to this day. You know, I had a similar experience with my family. My dad and his brothers were part of that generation of young African-American men who served in World War II mm -hmm. in a segregated military mm -hmm. to defend freedoms they could not exercise when they came home. They went out there and put their lives on the line yeah. and came back and still were treated like second-class citizens. Uh -huh. and when I started to really grasp that as a young child, I would say to my dad or my uncles, how, you know, what, how did you go through that and still have such a strong belief in the American dream? Basically, they said, we had no choice. Right. But we have, you know, our parents and grandparents came through slavery, mm -hmm. which was even worse. And so we have to believe it's going to get better. Uh, otherwise, you just give up and life is meaningless. Right. That was probably yeah. one of their only hopes. Yeah. You're forced into a situation, yeah. but you've got life on the other side if you can survive it. You're right. And they, right? Lived, they lived to see their kids enjoy the freedoms they were denied. Well, I have to say, you are <laughs> always just a bright shining, beautiful spirit and just a, a wonderful person to kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm taking it. I'm taking what you got to give. And um, I know there's some very exciting stuff on the horizon for you. Yes. And we will continue to um, watch you on on the news. I hope so. I hope and so. Uh, you are welcome back here anytime to talk yeah. about whatever it is you well, want to talk about. As some about. of these other bright things on the horizon appear, I'll come back and we'll talk. Please do, okay. Spencer. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. A pleasure. Generations. This peaceful island has been home to our family. But beyond our reef, a great danger is coming. Legend tells of a hero who will journey to find the demigod Maui. And together, they will save us all. of the wind and sea, I am Hero of Men. Wh what? It's actually Maui shapeshifter, demigod of the wind and sea, Hero of Men. I interrupted from the top, Hero of Men. Go. I'm not going on a mission with some little girl. This is my canoe, and you will journey to death room. Thank you so much for being with me today, Ali. It's a oh, pleasure. Thank you for having me. Love the movie. Thanks. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you came to audition for the role of Moana and what that process was like? Sure. Um, my audition story was is an interesting one. I didn't initially audition for Moana because I was a freshman in high school. I was figuring out how high school worked. High school is a confusing time. Um, I was really focusing on microbiology and my studies, so I wasn't planning on auditioning for anything. But as fate would have it, my friends and I decided to put together an audition for a nonprofit organization. We were hoping to become the entertainment of the event, and you know, we made an acapella mashup, and we put together harmonies and beatboxing, and we didn't even get into the first round of auditions. But the woman who was going through those auditions was also the casting director for Disney. So she asked if I wanted to audition for Moana, which I said yes, thank goodness. <laughs> and changed your life forever. Absolutely. Amazing, that's yeah. an incredible story. You film this movie, mm -hmm. you skyrocket to stardom, and you're a high school student all at the same time. Yes. What's that like? Uh, it's <laughs> challenging, I will be the first to say that. I am still doing schooling, whether it's on a boat, a plane, a train, wherever I am, uh, I'm still getting my junior year completed. I am taking chemistry and English, of course, and economics, and all of my usual classes. But it's a little bit different. Um, I don't see my friends every day, and I miss them so, so, so much. But I'm working it out, and I am so grateful for my role in Moana as well as my career, but that doesn't mean that anything else in my life gets to drop. I think that's impressive. Thank you. I have a great mom. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> I have. She has a great daughter. Thanks. What do you find most inspiring about your character, Moana? Most inspiring? Uh, 
so many things are inspiring. About I could, her. I have a list like a right, long right here. Right, um, she's beautiful and kind, and she loves her family. I think what I really appreciate is that she's the heroine of her own story, and that she doesn't have a love interest. She's the one who makes the decision to leave her island, and she's the one who saves the world at the end. Um, she's really someone that I hope to grow up to be. She is, like I said, the heroine of her own story, and she journeys hundreds of miles across the open ocean to figure out who she is. And that's such an important moral. She's the descendant of voyages. Right? Mm -hmm. We do this at home. Oh yeah. The voyages. Oh yeah. <laughs> How are you and she similar, or different? Um, we're quite similar. I grew up on an island all my life, so does Moana. I'm very deeply rooted to my uh, Polynesian culture. I go to an all Hawaiian school where the folklore of Maui and the history of our ancestors navigating by the stars, that's in our curriculum. I grew up in a small town of which I grew up with pigs and chickens. <laughs> Perfect. I live about 20 minutes away from the beach. Doesn't get more similar than no, that. No, you're very similar. I noticed after watching your performance at the Oscars, mm -hmm. to which my entire family cheered and applauded. Uh, thank you. A couple of tears, too. <laughs> thank you. I see two young women who are um, the epitome of grace and strength and resolve. Mm -hmm. You did such a beautiful job. Um, when that fan swung around <laughs> and hit you in the head, <laughs> And you just kept on going. Ah, Bravo. What thank was, you. What were, the, what were the Oscars like? Oh, the Oscars was amazing and crazy and busy, and there were a lot of people shouting. Um, but all in all, it was the most amazing experience of my life. I was able to perform with Lin-Manuel Miranda, the genius behind our music. Um, Dwayne Johnson introduced us. Uh, Come on. Pretty good introduction. Um, and I got to sing How Far I'll Go, a song that talks about how a girl could, you know, expand her horizons and listen to the voice inside of her and become the person she's meant to be. It was, ah, uh, it was amazing. Meryl Streep was right in front of me, like in the front row as well. I almost like spat my heart out into her lap. She was close enough for that to happen. My mom was also in the audience and I will never forget that. Amazing. You were perfection. Thank truly. You. Oh. So what is next for Awili Cravalho? I have gotten cast in a pilot. I got cast <laughs> in a pilot and it's NBC and it's filmed in New York, which means I get to wear boots okay. and write scarves. And a coat. And a coat. Oh, they make so many pretty clothes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's Drama High. It's about high schoolers who are brought together by theater and their love for the arts. And I'm so excited for the pilot. And so it's a pilot, but you know they're gonna pick it up. So, really all right, so. Well, we'll be rooting for you. Thank and you, thank you, you are thank just you. as wonderful as one would imagine. Oh. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you.